This is the second installment of our two-part series on the rise and fall of Reynold de Chatillon. In the previous video, we delved into Reynold's ascent to power and his eagerness towards violence. We also explored his animosity towards Islam, which grew more intense during his imprisonment in Zengid prison. Lastly, we touched upon his appointment to Jerusalem's inner circle and the kingdom's state of decline and its divisions. In this video, we will pick up from where we left off and concentrate on the events leading up to the Kingdom of Jerusalem's collapse. But before we start, as always, please remember to like, share and subscribe and to leave a comment in the comment section as this would really help our video on the YouTube algorithm. Jazakallah khairan. For those unaware, Yusuf ibn Ayyub famously known as Salah al-Din, was the Islamic champion of the late 12th century. He was a Muslim military leader and Sultan of Egypt and parts of Syria, renowned for his successful campaigns against the Crusaders. Salah al-Din, like his predecessor Nur al-Din, was known for his piety and support of Sunni Islam. One of his most notable achievements was ending the Fatimid Ismaili Empire and the Sunnification of Egypt. At a more intimate level, there exists numerous instances that truly exemplifies how remarkable he had been. Firstly, his devotion to Salah. Ibn Shaddad writes, As for the Fard prayers, he performed them assiduously and used to pray in public. In fact, one day he remarked that it was years since he performed them any other way. When he was ill, he would send for one Imam and forced himself to rise and pray with him. He further writes, He was assiduous in his performance of the Sunnah prayers. If he woke up during the night, he would make two rak'at, and if not, he would perform them before the morning prayer. And then adds, he never omitted the Fard prayer, except when he was at death's door in the last three days of his life, during which time he was unconscious. If the hour of prayer came around while he was travelling, he would dismount from his horse and pray. He further writes, He put his companions at their ease. He would ask one, about one's health, how one looked after oneself, how one was eating and drinking and all about oneself. Conversation in his circle was unusually honest, though no one was spoken of except in praise. He liked to hear only good of people and had a very restrained tongue. In fact, I have never heard him speak ill of someone with enjoyment. He also reports that Salah ad din possessed extensive knowledge and was highly studious, stating, Salah ad din was a pleasant companion, affectionate and shrewd, well versed in genealogy and the battles of the Arabs, their history and the genealogy of their horses and the wonders and curiosity of the country. So much so that anyone who had the pleasure of his company would learn things that he could have heard from no one else.
By the end of the Crusade era, Salah al-Din would leave a legacy in his own right. His personality earned him admiration from both Muslims and Christians. His reputation as a benevolent and honorable leader made him a figure of legend in European Romanticism, with writers and poets often portraying him as a symbol of the ideal knight and chivalry. Salah al-Din's legacy continues to inspire Muslims today, and his life is still studied around the world. During the early years of Salah al-Din's reign, he encountered numerous challenges. He faced opposition from factions in Egypt that had previously been loyal to the now defunct Fatimid Empire leading to rebellion. Additionally, after Nur al-Din's passing in 1174 common era, the Ummah experienced a crisis that necessitated Salah al-Din's involvement. The Zengids who had previously been supporters of the Ummah had become corrupt and refused to acknowledge Salah al-Din's authority, making them one of his most significant adversaries. They even hired the infamous Order of Assassins to eliminate him. During this time, Salah al-Din engaged in two minor battles with the Kingdom of Jerusalem. One which he lost, and one which he won. Reflecting on both battles, Salah al-Din realized that he could not mount a full-scale attack against the Kingdom of Jerusalem until he annexed the former Zengid territories. As a result, he signed a temporary truce agreement with the Kingdom of Jerusalem through Count Raymond to allow him to achieve this objective. However, in either late 1182 or early 1183 common era, Reynold violated the truce by launching an assault through the Red Sea. He blockaded the Muslim-controlled port of Aqaba and attacked its land, massacring some of its citizens. To make matters worse, as a means of humiliating the Ummah, he directed some of his fleet to proceed south to the Hejaz region with the aim of attacking Medina. Abu Shama documented this event as the following. He ordered the rest of the ships to head out to the sea and to attack the trading ships and to kill and plunder everything. Afterwards, they went to Hejaz where they caused great harm and the people of Medina were exposed to danger. On this, Salah al-Din would write an angry letter to the Caliph for his lack of aid and of the stubbornness of the Zengids of Musul, writing, We were trying to protect the city of Allah's Messenger, alayhi salam, while the ruler of Musul was fighting to maintain sovereignty over a city that was always in our hands. He was doing his best to take control of it by means of fighting and all kinds of transgression. We must bear in mind that Salah al-Din was neither caliph or technically the leader of the Ummah, and yet he saw it as his responsibility to defend Mecca and Medina, while those in charge essentially did nothing. Reynold of Shatian's unprecedented Red Sea campaign stirred outrage in the Muslim world, making him a loathed and despised figure. Salah al-Din was so furious, despite the Ayyubid's pledge to spare the lives of the participating crusaders, he ordered them to be executed. He would also swear that he would kill Reynold for his transgression. In spite of this, Salah al-Din did not launch an all-out attack on the Kingdom of Jerusalem 
just yet. Although it seemed unnecessary, as the ongoing problems of succession were now boiling over. After King Baldwin IV of Jerusalem died in 1185 Common Era, his nephew Baldwin V became king, with Count Raymond of Tripoli as his regent and co-ruler. Upon receiving this position, Count Raymond immediately signed a true steel to Salah al-Din. But Baldwin V died mysteriously in 1186 Common Era, leading to a succession crisis. The inexperienced and foolish knight Guy one of the Hawks, became king due to a series of political events that occurred. Angry, Count Raymond, who likely wanted the throne for himself, refused to submit to King Guy and left Jerusalem for Tripoli, allegedly asking Salah ad-Din for protection against King Guy and Reynold in case of an invasion. On this, the historian Thomas Asbridge accuses Raymond of trying to engineer an outright civil war. In total contrast, Ibn Athir couldn't conceal his happiness at the internal fighting amongst the Crusaders, expressing several of the Franks followed his course of action, thus their unity was disrupted and their cohesion broke him. This was one of the most important factors that brought about the conquest of their territories and the liberation of Jerusalem. As discussed in part 1 of this series, internal conflict is often one of the most telling indicators of a kingdom's or power's impending collapse. In the case of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, such strife had escalated to the brink of civil war due to the significant and diverse factions within the kingdom. Moving on. In spite of the truce between the Kingdom of Jerusalem and Salah ad-Din, Reynold de Chatillon once again broke it using brutal tactics. The reason behind Reynold's actions is uncertain. It could be an attempt to undermine Raymond, as the truce was signed when he was regent, or it could be sheer malice or greed. However, in either late 1186 or early 1187 Common Era, Reynold attacked a caravan on its way from Egypt to Syria, killing some of its carriers and taking some as prisoners. When a Muslim from the caravan reminded Reynold of the truce, he responded in a blasphemous nature, and while I won't quote him word for word, he essentially said, tell your prophet to release you, wa'aw the billah. In times of great oppression, it would be wise to remember the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Wa la tahsaban Allah ghafilan amma ya'malu al-zalimun Innama yuakhiruhum liyawmin tashkhasu fihi al-absar and in another verse, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In Allah, la yakhfa alayhi shay'un fil ardi wa la fil sama. Huwa alladhi yusawwirukum fil arham kayfa yasha. La ilaha illa huwa al aziz al hakim.
Furthermore, we must reflect back to the hadith which we mentioned earlier about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answering the dua of the oppressed. It could very well be that one of those who were taken prisoners by Reynolds called upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala against Reynolds' tyranny. Upon learning of Reynolds' betrayal, the Kingdom of Jerusalem became anxious about the potential consequences. They were aware that Salah ad-Din would view this as a violation of the truce agreement signed in 1185 Common Era, and the kingdom could now face a large-scale invasion as a result. Let's establish something here. Regardless, Salah ad-Din would have still inevitably went after Jerusalem. Reynolds' actions against the caravan, however, simply forced Salah ad-Din to act sooner. Going back to the events, after learning of Reynolds' actions, Salah ad-Din became enraged and swore to kill Reynolds once again. In an attempt to save the Muslims who were taken captive, Salah ad-Din sent messages to Reynolds, demanding the release of the prisoners and their belongings as per the truce agreement. However, Reynolds declined to meet with the messengers. The Ayyubids instead sought help from King Guy of Jerusalem. Unfortunately for them, Guy, who was known for his incompetence, refused to intervene, likely due to fear of Reynold, which demonstrated his complete lack of control over him. As a result, their fate was now sealed. Salah ad-Din decided to launch a full-scale invasion against Jerusalem. After Reynolds' attack on the caravan, Salah ad-Din decided to revoke the truce he had previously signed with Jerusalem. He urged all Muslims in the area to join him in the upcoming battle against the Crusaders. At the same time, in accordance with the Agreement of Protection, Salah ad-Din sent a message to Count Raymond, requesting permission for some of his men to pass through his territory. Here, it finally dawned on Raymond that Salah ad-Din simply took advantage of the inner fighting within the Kingdom of Jerusalem, but it had become too little too late. The damage had already been done. Understanding that Salah ad-Din had politically outmaneuvered him, although Count Raymond felt uncomfortable, he understood that he could not refuse the request. However, when the Crusaders found out about Count Raymond's actions, they accused him of converting to Islam and threatened to excommunicate him. Recognizing his error, Count Raymond agreed to support the Crusaders in the upcoming battle against Salah ad-Din. On the 2nd of July 1187 Common Era, Salah ad-Din set his plan in motion, attacking the poorly guarded town of Tiberias. The Franks quickly surrendered, except for the citadel, where Lady Esquiva, the wife of Raymond of Tripoli, sought refuge. Salah ad-Din allowed this information to reach the Crusaders, then waited. Salah ad-Din's intention was to pressure Guy into action by exposing the vulnerable state of Tiberias. King Guy called upon his council to decide upon what to do next. Despite Tiberius belonging to him and his wife being potentially under threat, Count Raymond encouraged King Guy not to act, informing him, Tiberius is mine and my wife's. Salah ad-Din has already done to the city what he has done. The citadel remains and my wife is in it. I would be happy if we took the citadel, my wife and our possessions, and retired. By God, I have seen the armies of Islam, 
both in the past and recently. But I have never seen such a numerous and powerful army as Salah ad-Din's. If he takes Tiberias, he would not be able to stay there. When he leaves and retires, we shall recover it. If he does stay there, he will only be able to do so with all his forces, and they will be unable to endure the long time away from their homes and families. So he will be compelled to leave, and we will ransom our people who have been taken prisoner. Raymond was essentially saying that there was no need to confront him. Salah ad-Din would not be able to stay in Tiberias. The best thing to do was to wait it out, because eventually he would be forced to leave, and it appeared that he was winning the people over. But Reynold would then interfere and overpower him and accuse him of treachery and cowardice, stating, You have tried hard to make us afraid of Muslims. Clearly, you take their side, and your sympathies are with them. Otherwise, you would not have spoken in this way. As for the size of their army, a large load of fuel would be good for the fires of hell. And if you wanted any confirmation that Reynold was indeed the Abu Jahl of his era, here it was. In an eerie resemblance, at the eve of the Battle of Badr, Utba bin Rabiha advised against confronting the Muslims, stating, I see people who are determined to fight to the death. Your meeting them will not have any good outcome for yourselves. Wrap up my head, men and say, Utba ibn Rabiha has turned coward, yet you know that I am not the most cowardly of you. To which Abu Jahl interjected and said, Is this what you are saying? By God, if it were anyone else saying this, I would bite him. Your lungs and your belly are full of fear. The idea of returning to Mecca became appealing to the leaders of Quraysh, once they learned that their caravan had been saved. However, like Reynold, Abu Jahl's hatred towards Islam pressured those who had second thoughts in taking part, and ultimately both led their followers into disaster. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs everyone of the fate of those who misled others. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Wa qala alladheena kafaru rabbana arina alladheini adallana min aljinni wal ins نجعلهما تحت أقدامنا ليكونا من الأسفلين Going back to the events of the Crusades, on the 4th of July 1187 coming era, the Battle of Hattin ended in a disastrous defeat for the Crusaders, with Salah ad-Din emerging victorious. Reynold and King Guy were both taken captive and presented to Salah ad-Din. Salah ad-Din offered King Guy a drink of water, which he accepted and then passed on to Reynold. However, Salah ad-Din interrupted and declared, Not with my permission did this accursed man drink water and so gain my safe conduct. Indicating that he intended no hospitality towards Reynold. Salah ad-Din then addressed Reynold, recounting the wicked deeds he had committed, before executing him. Afterwards, Salah ad-Din would say, 
Twice have I vowed to kill him if I had him in my power. Once when he wished to march on Mecca and Medina, and again when he treacherously seized the caravan. Following the Battle of Hattin, Salah ad-Din went on to capture Jerusalem later that year, while King Guy remained in captivity until his eventual release. Count Raymond, on the other hand, managed to evade capture, and there were even some suggestions that the Muslim army recognized him and allowed him to escape. Regardless, he did not live long after the battle, as he passed away shortly after returning to Tripoli, around October of the same year. Reynold, much like Pharaoh of Egypt and Abu Jahl of Quraysh, had led his people to disaster. His example serves as a telling case study of how a single individual can cause extensive harm to both his enemies and allies. This should serve as a cautionary example against demagoguery and the dangers of allowing the wrong type of people to gain power. If you liked the video, please remember to like, share and subscribe. While you're at it, you might want to check out some of the other videos we have on the channel. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.